I'm going to, um, first of all, conduct what I think I can best describe as a brief ceremony, and I'm not going to tell you any more because you'll find out what I'm talking about in a few seconds. Um, then I'm going to spend the first probably half of the talk talking about um, my own views of how we might seriously postpone and indeed defeat aging without the help of nanorobots and such like. I'm then going to talk a little bit more in terms of, um, I guess, public relations and where I see the opportunity increasingly arising to be able to make a better case for the feasibility of cryonic re revival than we have historically been able to make. And I will also touch briefly um, towards the end of the talk on what I see as the really rather strong likelihood of a very sharp increase in the interest, in, in the take up of cryonics um, that may, may happen really quite soon um, without something so dramatic as a rat being cryopreserved and then revived, for example. Um, but as I said, I'm going to start here. The Methuselah Mouse Prize, which we now simply call the M Prize, is doing quite well at the moment. Uh, this is the amount we have in the bank. Uh, this is the total amount we have if we include pledges, principally made by members of what we call the 300 Club, people who've undertaken to give roughly $1,000 a year for 25 years. And we're pretty happy about all that. It's been growing as fast as really any of us could have hoped that it would during the four years that it's gone forward so far, when David Goebel and I founded it. One thing that's also happened during that time is that the number of individual donors has been going up at a nice respectable rate. And that's very important because, after all, the Emprise is really part of our campaign to popularize life extension. The number of individual donors in the official count came up to just 400, just yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. But actually, that number is not precisely accurate. And here's why. This is one of the entries in the list of donors, and you won't be able to read it very well from here, so I'm going to help you a little bit. The donor's name is up here, and that name is Aviana Viff. It says here when the donation was made and the amount, which is $3,002. And the, re the way that Aviana raised this $3,002 is also mentioned here. It says she decided to canvass the grown-ups in her neighborhood to donate to the cause. And the number of donors that Aviana succeeded in attracting funds from was really rather large. So we thought that it would be important to demonstrate our appreciation of this. I made a little certificate here, um, which I'm going to give Aviana, um, and I'll show you what it says. It's here. This certificate of appreciation of outstanding achievement contributing to the war on aging is awarded by the Methuselah Foundation to Aviana Viff in recognition of her collection of $3,002 in donations to the prize, obtained by extensive door-to-door -door solicitations between April and June 2005, when she was just eight years old. I'd like Avi Iron please to come up now and receive this and say a few words of her own. going to say about the Methuselah Mouse Prize today. I'm going to focus mainly on the other activity of the foundation, the Methuselah Foundation, and I'm going to just spend a couple of slides now explaining why the Methuselah Foundation has both of these activities. The record of prizes over the past many centuries, really, certainly the past few centuries, in spurring innovation is very impressive indeed. Many of you have probably heard of the Longitude Prize, which was offered for a timekeeping device sufficiently accurate to be able to allow ships to know where they were when they were crossing oceans. The Orteg Prize, which was offered for the first flight across the Atlantic and was won, of course, famously by Charles Lindbergh. And much more recently, the X Prize for space tourism. Many more of these exist. And the key point is this, that it's a very efficient way to get money spent on an important technological innovation that 
catches people's imag imagination. Exactly what proportion it is depends on what numbers you look at, but it's at least a fifth, and by some reckonings it's about one fiftieth of the money that is spent. It has to be in the prize kitty in order to make the whole thing work. So the question is, when are prizes appropriate? And this is how I think about it, that prizes are really good when nobody really knows what's going to work. Nobody really knows where to start, but lots of people have their own ideas. It's not so appropriate when the consensus really is pretty confident about what's going to work, and the question is simply resources. So I've given the examples here of the Apollo project or the Manhattan project. I don't think it would have been quite so appropriate to encourage those sort of things to work simply by offering a prize incentive. So then the question is, you know, what's the situation with life extension? And the position that we in the Methuselah Foundation have is that it's hard to say. Because we have a detailed plan for how to fix aging. It's my plan, and I'll be telling you about it shortly. But we don't know whether my plan's going to work. So we would like other people to have a go as well, and therefore it makes sense to hedge our bets by promoting both the directed approach, the, you know, if you like, the organized approach, and the distributed approach. So I'm going to move on to what sense is and a little bit about the science of it. And in order to um, present this, I have to really start by defining what the problem is. In other words, what aging is. Aging is a side effect of being alive in the first place. In other words, it's the accumulation of damage. And one of the most important things that I always have to get across to any audience, especially audiences who are not all expert biologists, is that one has to demystify aging. One has to explain what aging is in a manner that gets people out of the mode that it's something that we can't fix, therefore it's something that we don't understand. The fact is we do understand aging. Aging is simply a maintenance problem. It's the accumulation of damage, molecular and cellular damage. This damage accumulates as a side effect of normal metabolic processes, and therefore it accumulates throughout life. And eventually it causes pathology. It causes bad things, whether they be age-related diseases or frailty and general debilitation that we don't necessarily call diseases. Here's a big problem. This is metabolism. Metabolism is unbelievably complicated. In fact, it's much worse than this, because this is simply a summary of some subset of that subset of metabolism that we actually understand already. And the amount that we understand already is a tiny fraction of what's really going on. You won't find any biologist who would dispute this. It's absolutely clear that we have hardly scratched the surface of the complexity of even how cells work, let alone how organisms work. So, you know, stopping it from laying down all this damage is, is, seems like a tall order. Here's the second problem. The pathologies are extraordinarily many and varied as well. This is a small list of some few of the thousand slings and arrows that, that flesh is heir to, as Shakespeare said, and it's hard to know how to keep all these things at bay. This is really the conclusion that people in the field have come to over the decades that they've been worrying about this, that neither of the two obvious ways of going about postponing aging is really particularly promising at this point in time. I'm calling them here the gerontology approach and the geriatrics approach, and the difference between them is how far along the chain of events from metabolism to pathology they intervene. The problem with the gerontological approach is that its heart is in the right place, so to speak. It, aims with the idea that prevention is better than cure, but we understand metabolism so poorly that it's more or less impossible to improve on metabolism and clean it up and to do better than evolution has already done. Conversely, the geriatrician's approach is, has the advantage that we're intervening in the pathology directly and therefore we don't really necessarily have to understand too much about how the pathology actually arose in the first place. But on the other hand, because things have spun out of control at that point, it's a losing battle, and we're only ever going to be able to postpone things a little bit. So the conclusion that most of my colleagues, in fact, more or less all of my colleagues, have come to is that aging will continue to defeat us for centuries. And the reason I don't agree is the fact that things only start going seriously wrong in the body during the second half of life is a big opportunity. Because, as I mentioned earlier, Aging is a side effect of metabolism, and therefore the damage that is the precursor of pathology is accumulating throughout life. By definition, more or less, metabolic consequences happen throughout life because metabolism is a set of chemical reactions. So there must be some sort of threshold level below which these side effects, this damage, is harmless, is inert. 
So we can say this. We can say, yes, damage eventually causes pathology, but metabolism ongoingly causes damage. Damage is being defined in this slide for this purpose of this talk as the intermediaries between metabolism and pathology that are only present at the molecular and cellular level. They are not actually causing functional deficit until they get up to a level of sufficient abundance that metabolism can no longer function in their presence so well as it used to. And the reason this is so useful is because it gives us a third way of intervening in aging other than these two. We can put damage in my little diagram down here and we can say, well, basically gerontology is about slowing down the rate at which metabolism causes damage and geriatrics is about slowing down the rate at which damage causes pathology. And the third approach, which I like to call the engineering approach, says let's not do either of those things. Let's actually intervene at an intermediate point in the chain of events. And the logic here is that we get the best of both worlds. We get the best of the geriatrician's world in that we don't have to understand what's going on up here very much in order to intervene in this initially inert family of changes that accumulate in the body and that I'm calling damage. But at the same time, we're intervening early enough in the chain of events that things have not yet spiraled out of control and we have a chance of being able to do this indefinitely. And I claim that this adds up to a good reason to suppose that the engineering approach can achieve substantial and in fact dramatic extension of human lifespan and healthy lifespan relatively soon on a time frame of decades. I like to use the analogy of houses. I think I may have used this four years ago. I haven't thought of that until now. Um, Houses are a success story of civilization. We have houses in my country anyway that have been up and working and, and continuously working um, as habitable places for hundreds of years. Now, they weren't built to last hundreds of years, most of them. They were built to last maybe 50 years. And the reason they've lasted longer is because we know how to make them last longer. We know how to do the maintenance. Here's what happens to a house with no maintenance, one of the things. Storm damage happens in the roof and water gets in and eventually you get pathology. You get staircases collapsing and ceilings falling down and so on. So our three heroes from the previous slide are up here. You've got your geriatrician running around worrying about the pathology, you know, putting the ceiling up and the stairs but not worrying about the initial damage. And it's a losing battle, obviously. The person's going to have to find somewhere to live fairly soon because water is increasingly accumulating in the fabric of the house. The gerontologist is trying to be preemptive and plant tall trees around the house to diminish the rate at which storm damage would happen in the first place. And that's problematic because he's introducing a new problem, namely the possibility that the storm will blow uh, some big branch off the tree that will smack into the roof and make a bigger hole than it would have happened anyway. The gerontologist in this allegory doesn't understand the weather. He only understands the damage, and so he's making a mistake that's making matters worse, whereas the engineer is intervening at the appropriate point in the chain of events, so to speak, fixing the damage as it accumulates. Now, the question, of course, is why is this analogy something that I think is valid? And the answer is because the damage is much simpler than either metabolism or pathology that I showed you earlier. I have been making the somewhat outrageous claim for the past few years that the, all the types of damage that really matter, that significantly... Um, contribute to eventual age-related functional decline and pathology can be fitted into these seven major categories. Intracellular molecular garbage, shall we say, or extracellular garbage, diminution of cells, cells dying and not being replaced, cells accumulating and not dying when we'd like them to, um, mutations in the chromosomes and also in our mitochondria, and stiffening of long-lived tissues due to new extra chemical linkages that accumulate in them. No new type of damage, in addition to this seven, these seven categories, has been identified for 24 years now. That's pretty good news. So we can look at it like this. You know, here are the, here's a small number of the types of damage in type 2 font, and the same with pathology, but you've just got this small number of types of intermediate between the two. And if we could deal with all these, if we could fix them all, then we would be uncoupling met metabolism from pathology, and we would have solved the aging problem. So the question is, how close are we to fixing these things? And before I show you the next slide, I want to emphasize that when I say fix, I don't mean stop the damage from happening. I mean fixing the damage itself after it has happened. It's central to my whole thesis that what we should actually be looking at is not taking the concept of prevention being better than cure too far. We should be actually looking at repair and maintenance processes, which may be easier to implement than preemption processes, so to speak. And the short answer is, I think we know how to fix them all. I don't, we can't do it yet, but I have um, developed this 
panel of proposed interventions, which I call SENSE, which stands for this long phrase. And basically, here they are. We can, obviously, you've all heard about stem cell therapy for various problems, various maladies, some of them age-related. Stem cell therapy is essentially the way that we are going to fix the problem of cell death without compensatory replacement of cells happening naturally. We fix that by artificial medical replacement of those cells. And you can go on down the list. But anyway, the bottom three are the hardest ones, and they're the ones that I've been working on myself. The other ones are actually already going pretty well. Most of them are in clinical trials already. The hardest ones, I think, are only about 10 years away in mice, and perhaps only another 20 years away in humans, though that's much more speculative. Here's my mouse milestone. And the reason I think it's only 10 years is because of the amount of detail that we have already in the, in the plan, in exactly how we would go about implementing these various fixes to all of these various types of problem. This is my definition of a milestone that I think will change public attitudes to life extension irretrievably. Most mice live about two years. Really nice long-lived strains of mice that are already pretty healthy live about three years. What I'd like to do is take mice of such healthy strains and wait and do nothing at all to them until they're already two years old, already in middle age. So they've got a year left. Okay. Before, up until that time, they've had nothing genetic done to them, nothing dietary, no drugs, and to trouble their remaining lifespan is what I want to do. That's a pretty tall order, but I don't think it's impossible. In fact, I think it can be done with sufficient funding. Now, I think we need quite a lot of funding. $100 million a year for 10 years, and I think if we had that, we'd have a 90% chance of getting there because all of the various approaches to fixing these seven problems that I think have a good chance of working could actually be supported. We're talking about something in the region of 500 full-time scientists um, with all the facilities and equipment and everything. would be that sort of number. It sounds like a lot of money. But, well, it's more money to some people than it is to others. And a couple of weeks ago, as some of you probably know, we made a good start. Peter Thiel, who co-founded PayPal and who became really rather wealthy a couple of years ago, having been the CEO of PayPal when PayPal was sold to eBay, he is slightly less wealthy now because he's given three and a half million dollars to me, and he's done so in order to accelerate this work. This means, from my point of view, that we are a big step forward to getting my hundred million dollars a year that I need to fix aging in mice in ten years. So that's what I'd like to do. Um, as I said, in terms of how long it's going to take to get things working in humans, it could be another 15 or 20 years after that. I think we've probably got a 50% chance of that being the case, 15 or 20 years after we get the mice working. But it could be 100 years if we get unlucky with the science. But I'll take, 50, I'll take a 50-50 chance. That's worth trying. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about PR. Cryonics, of course, has been around a lot longer than I have, um, and a lot longer than SENSE has. And Cryonics still only has 1,000, 1,500 people or so signed up as members. This is a problem that you guys have been addressing w with, you know, a great deal of expertise and um, creativity for a long time. But the fact is we haven't cracked it yet. We have not sold Cryonics to the masses. And those of us who understand that Cryonics is not a method of um, burial or of, or of, or of um, disposal of human remains, but rather a type of critical care, you know, we all appreciate that this is a great tragedy, that people are passing up the chance of a, a longer life, a longer healthy life for that matter. There are many reasons why so few people sign up, and I'm not going to bother trying to enumerate those reasons because most of you here are familiar with the field and what these reasons are. I'm just going to talk specifically about one of those reasons, one of the major ones, which is scepticism as to whether the technical ability to revive people and, of course, to fix the problems that they died of in the first place will ever be developed. Now, I think a lot of us, especially those of us with a scientific background, have tended to feel that it's, you know, just surprising that this should be such a big deal, that this should be such a problem. Because the fact is, the whole point of cryonics is that we've got as long as we want for humanity to develop the technology. And therefore, the technology can be pretty much arbitrarily hard because we'll get there eventually and liquid nitrogen temperatures are low enough that that's okay. It just doesn't seem to get through to most people. Most people just don't like the nanobot argument. 
The fact that we don't need to know yet how to revive patients is just not very helpful rhetorically for most people. In my experience, I mean, of course, I welcome other people who tell me that this isn't the case, but when I talk to people about cryonics, I find that this logic, they don't deny it, they just don't like it. They find it fishy. I was particularly motivated to talk about that today when I watched Death in the Deep Freeze and Arthur Rowe, a, a senior member of the cryobiology community and noted and vocal skeptic with regard to cryonics, was interviewed extensively. This is one thing that Arthur Rowe said in that film. Do I think that the money spent on cryonics is a waste? By and large, yes. The people who are working on trying to preserve organs, it's an admirable thing. But cryonics has no redeeming value. Now, hang on. <laughs> what is so different from a cryobiology point of view? You know, let's leave, the, let's leave all of the ethics and the, you know, the, the, the philosophy and so on out of it. Let's just think about cryobiology, because this guy, Art Rowe, he's a, he's a biologist, right? The brain, I thought the you know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought the brain was made out of cells, you know, same as the rest of other, uh, you know. How can the brain be considered to be so different that, from the liver or the kidney or whatever, that it's admirable, that was his word, admirable, to try to make cryopreservation work for organs, but cryonics itself has no redeeming value. It really struck me that that was something that someone should have actually challenged Arthur Rowe on, on film to see what he could say. So I'm going to leave that with you for a second. I'm going to come back to it in a moment. I'm just going to leave that thought hanging and talk about another thought, which is something that comes up a lot in my work. I, I work, of course, not in cryonics, but in trying to avoid cryonics. Um, we all know that cry cryopreservation is the second worst thing that can happen to you. I imagine Ralph was the first person to say that. He was the first person to say most of the clever things in this field. Um, um, one thing that I often get asked, a very frequently asked question, is, well, hang on, what's the point of being physically young if, if you can't keep the brain going? You know, the brain is somehow, somehow different, right? And of course, that's not true, because the brain is basically made of the same stuff, and the molecular and cellular therapies that I'm interested in getting developed are basically no different in the brain from other, other tissues. We have, perhaps you could say that we have less, less certainty that they will restore and maintain function in the brain than we have for other tissues because we understand so much less about how the brain works in detail. We don't, for example, really know that the brain will carry on being able to work as flexibly as it does when we, when we are young, in other words, during our first 100 years of life, um, but it remains to be seen. Um, so th the therapies certainly have a good chance of working. So I'm going to bring those two things together now. It seems to me that the feasibility of cryonics, the technical feasibility, is hard to sell because real people out there, Joe Bloggs in the street, don't like arguments that are along the lines of, it doesn't matter how hard it is, it can be arbitrarily hard, because we've got arbitrarily long. They don't like arguments that involve infinity. They just sound fishy to most people. Not for any good reason, you understand. Of course not. But nevertheless, they just don't like those sorts of arguments. Arguments that involve small numbers like 2, 2, and 4 are altogether more effective, it seems. So this is my experience. And even if uh, the argu an argument that's, you know, a familiar type of argument is actually logically weaker to someone who's really being dispassionate about it than the argument involving infinity, which of course I perfectly agree with, then it may nevertheless work better. This is what it really comes down to. Ultimately, we're talking about four different concepts here. Rejuvenating the body, rejuvenating the brain, reviving the body from cryostasis, and reviving the brain from cryostasis. And what I'm basically saying here is that these two arrows that I've highlighted in pink here are highly equivalent. You know, if we can get from rejuvenating body to rejuvenating the brain, because rejuvenating the brain isn't much harder, then that probably means that we can get from reviving the body from cryostasis to reviving the brain from cryostasis. That, the difference of difficulty there will be similar. It just sort of intuitively that ought to be the case. Similarly for these arrows. You know, if we can get from rejuvenation, the sort of thing that I work on, keeping people's organs going by maintenance when they're still functioning, to reviving those organs from cryostasis, if that's not a terribly big leap, then perhaps it's not a terribly big leap for the brain either. So what that means, of course, is that, you know, what I work on, real medicine, but especially the particular type of medical research that I work on, if that's possible, and if this is a pretty straightforward 
legitimate part of this, not a particularly qualitatively more difficult part, then, you know, that's a good start. Similarly, if cryobiology is a legitimate, even admirable field, including cryo suspension and resuscitation of organs, then we shouldn't really have too much difficulty in believing that cryonics is technically feasible in the foreseeable future. I find that this sort of argument works rather well. And I have plenty of time for Rob Freitas and, and um, Ralph Merkel's work on nanorobots. I think that it's more or less certain that we will need nanotechnology and artificial intelligence to revive um, you know, James Bedford or indeed anyone who was cryopreserved more than about 10 or 20 years ago. But I think we have now reached, with the development of M22 and other, other important developments, the point where it is reasonable to argue from a professional biological perspective, which is of course where I come from, that we may not need that for people who are cryopreserved with the best state-of-the-art technology available today. Now, of course, 20 years ago, you could have said to someone who was skeptical about the technical feasibility of, cryo of cryonics, you could have said, well, hang on, you're probably not going to die in the next 20 years. There's 20 more years of technical progress that you, you will be able to take advantage of before this matters. Therefore, you shouldn't worry about how things look now. But that's the same sort of argument from infinity that people don't seem to like. Now we don't need that anymore. We can argue from what we already know. If sense is something that I can go head to head with skeptical gerontologists about and usually win, which as you may know I have been doing lately, then um, we, are, we are only two steps. Furthermore, two steps by alternative paths from achieving the same sort of credibility for cryonics. You may remember that I defined a concept of robust mouse rejuvenation earlier, RMR I'm not calling it. I want to talk a little bit about the impact of that on cryonics. It strikes me as pretty certain that rats will not get up from a cryopreserved state with, with no warning. In other words, you know, the people who are working on cryopreservation of organs and of um, uh, implicitly the CNS and so on will, you know, th they interact a lot with the cryonics movement and the rate of progress and the plausibility of that sort of event, there will be some warning. But that's not the only thing that, in my mind, that's not the only development that could cause a really dramatic acceleration in interest in cryonics. As I mentioned earlier, there are many reasons why people don't sign up for cryonics, but the technical feasibility, as people see it, is a big one. And the argument, the, the, the logic I've been, um, been rehearsing over the past um, five minutes or so with regard to a nanobot-free um, argument for um, the feasibility of this in the long term is a good start, but ultimately things may happen fairly soon that are not actually directly relevant to cryopreservation, but which since, cryopre since cryonic resuscitation is ultimately a natural extension of resuscitation and repair and maintenance of people who are still alive, uh, still alive in the legal sense of course, um, that extrapolation is going to be made by the general public when dramatic things happen in life extension in the laboratory. Here is what I think might happen in 10 years' time. Middle-aged mice being rejuvenated in a very dramatic manner so that their remaining lifespan is troubled. The reason it's going to be dramatic in sociological terms is not because people will pick up their papers and read about it. It's because people will pick up their papers and read about the opinion of the field not just the opinion of me, but the opinion of the gerontological consensus concerning what it means for the prospects and the time frame for the corresponding result in humans. And gerontologists, I can tell you because I know them all personally, however skeptical they are now, when these mice get up and walk around for two years longer than they were otherwise going to, my colleagues will not hesitate to say, yes, we don't know how long it's going to be, but it's only a matter of time before we seriously fix aging by the same sort of means in humans. Another thing that may have happened by then is that in the case of organs other than the brain, cryostasis may very well have been validated considerably better than it has so far. The logic that I gave you earlier, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, is going to be hard to escape. People are going to put 2 and 2 together and realize that if revival from cryostasis is a natural extension of repair of legally living organisms. And if also we've got your middle-aged mice being rejuvenated and we've also got your organs being restored to function, then it will be very difficult to continue to argue that 
it's essentially impossible that cryonics will ever work. And the critical thing I want to point out is that this will be the first time ever that one of the major reasons, one of the many major reasons not to sign up for cryonics has ever been eliminated in the opinion of the general public. And this may very well happen quite soon. So it seems to me that we can't simply say, well, this is only one of the many reasons why people don't sign up, so it might double the number of people who sign up, but it certainly won't send it through the roof. I really don't think we can say that. I think that removing one of the, half, well, maybe half dozen big reasons why people don't sign up could really make cryonic sign-ups go up to doubling or more per year for an extended period. So I would, um, well, as, as David said, uh, no, it was actually Josh said earlier that maybe one way to um, um, anticipate the turbulence that lies ahead is to buy stock in something. And I would suggest stock in things that cryonics needs would be a, um, a good choice. Um, so my conclusions are here. I have simply just rehearsed what I just said. Reviving patients from cryostasis may be so hard that it needs nanotech and artificial intelligence. I think that's certainly true for patients who were cryopreserved a long time ago. But for patients who were only cryopreserved recently or who are cryopreserved during, let's say, the next 10 years with the best technology available, it may not need nanotech and artificial intelligence. We already, when we talk to people about cryonics, we stress the probabilistic logic. You know, we say, OK, it's, it's not certain to work. Even, we can't even put numbers on how likely it is to work, except insofar as we can say it's a lot better than being the controls. So finally, I think, I think from a PR perspective, we may make some headway by stressing that the difference between cryonic resuscitation and the sort of medical advances that I work on as a gerontologist is actually rather small, and that that is an easier argument to sell than an argument that's based on infinity. So I'll stop there. Thank you. There are a million things that go wrong with us during ageing, and a million things can be subdivided into seven categories in an awful lot of different ways. The reason that this particular categorization is useful is because within each category, the approach to fixing it that I consider to be um, most promising is more or less the same for each of, each of the subcategories you could think of, for example. So, I mean, in the case of loss of cells, Stem cell therapy is a big field. There are lots of people that work on, stem, on different types of stem cell and the differentiation of those cells into different types of tissue. And that's what we need because there are these differences between different organs and different cell types. But they go to the same conferences and listen to each other because a lot of the technology that they need is transferable from one tissue to another. And that's the same across the list of seven things. Uh, it's more to, there's more to it than that, though, of course. I mean... Um, the, 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 really what I think I ought to emphasize is that some tissues, and in particular some subsets of each of these categories, will be harder than others. We have to fix all of our tissues pretty well in order to double or treble the remaining healthy lifespan of someone who's already in middle age. And indeed, that's of course the same, that's also true for mice. Um, and this is why, when I give a longer um, presentation on this, I often emphasize that in order to give indefinite lifespans and genuinely defeat aging, we will need to do a great deal more in terms of technological advance than we can possibly do in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. But that that's okay because we will be buying time with each increase in the comprehensiveness of the technology. This is a concept which I've called longevity escape velocity, the idea of um, uh, uh, there's a certain rate of progress in improving the comprehensiveness of these therapies, which is sufficient to be functionally equivalent to having perfect therapies from the beginning, because the rate at which we are fixing new things increases enough to, over, uh, to outweigh the rate of accumulation of things that we have not yet worked out how to fix. And it turns out that that rate for humans is very modest and reliable, equivalent to the sort of rate that we normally see with technologies that can improve by small increments, whether it be powered flight since 1903 or computers since 1940 or whatever. Um, for mice, it would have to be 30 times faster, and I don't expect ever to see complete, the complete elimination of uh, age-related mortality increase in mice. We will not achieve longevity escape velocity in mice, but we will achieve it in humans, and I think we could do it from the point of only doubling, in other words, only adding, let's say, 30 years to the remaining lifespan of someone who's already in middle age.
We've talked in the Methuselah Foundation a little bit about whether cryopreservation should be allowed as an intervention for mice in the Methuselah Mass Prize, I mean. Um, and our feeling is, sure, why not? I mean, if you can um, resuscitate them, then that's such big news that we probably ought to actually give you some money for having done it. Um, but having a separate prize for, cryo, uh, resusc for resuscitation of a rodent from cryostasis seems to me to be eminently sensible as a way of increasing the, um, the uh, high profile of cryonics in a manner that doesn't trivialize it. That's exactly why we did the Methuselah Mass Prize in the first place. Um, of course, it will be a long time before it's won, but that's okay. It was a long time before the Longitude Prize was won and so on. That's, n that's not a problem in the slightest. I think that the fact that the science of cryonics is becoming so much more legitimized now with more and more publications in peer-reviewed journals and so on is, pr was probably a prerequisite without which the um, creation of a prize of the sort that you describe might have ended up doing more harm than good by, by attracting ridicule or whatever. But I think now that, that threshold has probably been passed. And so I would say it's not too soon. And I certainly don't think that it would dilute or, or in any way harm the efforts that we're making on organisms whose hearts are still beating.